there's a knock, knock, knocking at the door. So soft, Marianne thinks at first it's Pudding, her black behemoth of a cat. She goes to the door, nearly opens it on autopilot, so certain that Pudding has decided that the damp gray weather wasn't to his liking. In true cat nature, in spite of his begging to go out till she couldn't get anything done and gave in to his pleas. Her hand was on the doorknob, and something stops her. A cold, eerie sense of not rightness. Marianne pulls her hand from the door, moves to the window, parting the accordion blinds to peer out by the back door at what stood there. It was a little girl, maybe eight years old, fair-haired in a puff-sleeved dress. Nothing to fear, aside for the child's own safety, but odd, very odd. It's the wrong season for Girl Scout cookies, and Marianne couldn't remember the last time she had scouts of any gender come to her door seeking funds. So much has changed since her own plastic barrette unicorn days, with crimped hair, embarrassingly big gap tooth, and denim clad. Too much darkness come to light, dredged out of the muck. How monstrous humanity was, blinding those who would see it. So much to fear. Marianne hopes this child was only selling something for school, not lost, not hurt, or afraid. Too many people choose not to see the monstrous. As it is, she's not sure what she could do if the little girl needed help. Why come to her anyway? She barely spoke to her neighbors. The only neighborhood kids Marianne could remember seeing were the toddler twins, whose father was black and were far younger than the girl outside her door, and a handful of teens, far older. Why was she leaving her there alone so long? Why was the child still there, waiting with a still patience unusual in one so young? Where has she come from? Marianne asks herself if she should call the police. Social services? Would it do any good? Would it be a mistake to summon police so close to where Randall lived? To her, Randall was the father of a pair of chubby-cheeked, curly-haired two-year-olds, but she could too easily imagine what could happen if, and she hated to distrust the police, but she certainly couldn't trust them. Why was she delaying still? Marianne checks through the blinds again. The girl was still there, waiting. For what? Marianne had never seen a child stand so still. Even Aiden, one of her teenage neighbors, was always scratching at his arm, jiggling his foot, always in motion. Of course, he was a boy, but even a little girl, raised to be demure, shouldn't be so motionless. No one human should be so motionless. As Marianne watched, indecisive, uncertain, the little girl turned her face up to meet her gaze. Her eyes were black. No light, no iris. Black and deep and hungry. The plastic slats of the blinds clanked together as Marianne jerked away from the window, glad now that she hasn't opened up her door. Up to now, she'd been scolding herself for being so unnerved by nothing more than a child, but now she knew despite any rational explanation, that what stood outside was not a small child. Marianne regrets not knowing her neighbors better. True, she knew Aiden. He lived next door and peddled his lawn mowing and car washing services throughout the neighborhood. And she'd met Randall, who lived across the street, more or less, often enough to be on first name basis with him and his twins, though Marianne wasn't entirely sure what his last name was. But she can't imagine calling Randall to ask what he thought of a little girl wandering the neighborhood, if he was even aware of the girl. Even as horrified as Marianne was, she'd gone back to her bedroom, sitting on her bed to think, or not to think, with her back to the bedroom window. Marianne tried to keep herself from imagining the soulless eyes, the devouring void that existed in a child's face. Possibly she had imagined the eyes, dreamt them for they did hold that inexplicable terror that followed you in dreams, that caused you when you woke up, not trusting what was unseen in the dark. The child wasn't there the following morning, and Marianne went to her car. As soon as she had closed the door, as she was fastening her seatbelt, there was the girl at the door. Marianne almost screamed, managing somehow to gasp only and feel as if she might be sick. 
This was ridiculous. She drove away. What she thought she had seen, what she imagined, that couldn't be true. Why was she afraid of a little girl? Why was the girl so still, so silent? Most of all, why was she still there? There was no sign of her when Marianne returned home. She breathed a sigh of relief, allowed herself to feel that relief. The girl reappeared that evening, was still there the next morning, far earlier than there was any rational reason for her to be. Marianne, in this siege, feared letting pudding out. The cat was irritated, and logically Marianne knew that she should be more concerned about bored teenagers getting hold of her black cat than some odd little girl. But the longer the girl lingered, looking as if she was perfectly composed, the less logic factored into it. But Pudding had the ability to slip outside past Marianne's legs like a shadow, a whisper, despite his bulk. But the girl wasn't always there. Some hint of knowledge, some puzzle piece of memory came through to Marianne, as strangely unsettling as this was, there was something familiar about this. She wasn't sure if she was remembering some incidents from the murky depths of her childhood, or a story she'd read or, or somewhere heard. Marianne was troubled by her inability to remember, but as with most things these days, she could turn to the internet for answers. This did not always work, of course. Dimly recollected books were sometimes lost through the passage of time until they appeared to exist only in her mind and not the memories of others. But this, this stalking and haunting of this weird child, was not one of those dead-ending search queries. It took her to some questionably digitally manipulated images of children that were eerily reminiscent of the little girl that wouldn't leave her alone. The phenomenon of black-eyed children, which Marianne couldn't identify as a recent or age-old occurrence, an urban legend of the present day, or the lingering remnants of something born in the long-buried past. What troubled Marianne, even more than the fact that she wasn't alone, was that there was something unsaid, a difference in the accounts. It was all questionable sources. If things had been different, Marianne wouldn't have taken any of this seriously. She wasn't even sure most of them were meant to be taken seriously. Yet, here she was. What Marianne could not discover wasn't only what they were, of course no one could know that for certain, it was that no one had repeated encounters with the black-eyed children. She could find no accounts of multiple encounters with the children, no hints of their intent. All seemed to be a singular event, one encounter, or inciting, and then once rebuffed, they never saw the children again. Marianne was afraid to look out her windows, to go out her door. The child wasn't always there, her silent entreaty for entry, for some unspoken offering from Marianne, her eyes a void, somehow out of place, yet always there always there, it seemed, always there waiting, even when she was absent. Marianne wasn't comforted by what she'd discovered online. There were answers only to the existence of the children, yet no help on how to be rid of them, or advice, or even anything on what they might be, what they might mean, aside from the otherworldly. She wasn't even sure how to exercise a ghost or a demon, let alone some being that was other than those. She had no faith or certainty that even if she did know, it would be successful in ridding her of the girl. One night, at dusk, Marianne heard a tap tapping on her door. Hesitant, she padded over in her stocking feet. Here's Pudding. There he was, knocking against her door. Marianne wasn't sure how the cat had gotten outside, but in a half-waking haze, she couldn't recall when she'd last seen him. She let the cat inside, closing the door behind him. It was only then that she realized the cat's eyes were as dark as his fur as the night and reflected nothing.